Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's uh, new to 2016 support webinar. Uh, my name is David Zapka, and this morning what we're going to be covering is we're going to be covering new enhancements to beam connections and new enhancements to our horizontal brace connections as well. Uh, if you do have questions as we go along here relating to this topic, go ahead and use the questions pane over there in the GoToMeeting uh, toolbar. Type those in there or hold on to them at the end and you can type those in there at the end. I'll go ahead and take some time uh, here towards the end of the webinar and try and answer any questions that you do have that, that may come up. So, uh, First thing we got to start with here is going to be our uh, beam connections. So first thing I want to look at is we now have an option for plane end beam connections to actually specify a field clearance that we want set for those. So if I take a look down here, uh, one of my beams here, I've set this to a plane end connection on the left end. And we can see we have a clearance there. Now if I go ahead and go to my job options and my field clearance information, you're going to see a plain end option in here that's new. And right now it's set to a half. If I go ahead and set that in there to one and just go ahead and reprocess this beam. Okay, we can see that gap increases and we now have our one inch field clearance there that we can specify. Fairly simple there to start off with. Uh, next thing we have is some enhancements to the welds at skewed shear tab connections. So what we've actually done for this is uh, we've taken the information from table 10-14C in the AISC manual. Uh, that can be found on pages 10-176 and 10-177. So that actually specifies uh, with a range of degrees that you're framing into the supporting member and based on your shear plate thickness, what weld sizes should be used. And we can see in this case, uh, we have different weld sizes. So if I go ahead and edit this weld, we can see on the one side we have a half inch fillet on on the other side we have a, a quarter inch fillet so that's what that table specifies for beams framing at 17 to 30 degrees and if we were to go ahead and measure this and take a look at the angle that we're given we're at uh, 29.5, so we're just short of 30 degrees, so we fall under that 17 to 30 degree range. Now, if I were to go ahead and throw in a construction line here, I'm going to set it in at 85 degrees, and then I'm going to just stretch this beam over to that location right here. So now I'd be framing at less than 17 degrees to that to the supporting beam. And we should actually see now looks like our weld sizes did change. If I go ahead and edit that, I can see we now have 3 8 and 1 quarter, which again follows that table from the AISC manual. The next thing we have are some enhancements to uh, welded to supporting clip angle connections. And uh, basically what we've done here is uh, we've created a new table for you that we'll see here in a minute to set up um, between a workable flat distance what size of angles to use. So depending on the workable flat area, we can have it provide us with different size angles to fit on that workable flat area. Uh, <clears throat> so that table is actually going to be under your fabricator options in standard fabricator connections. If we go to our clip angle configurations, we have one table for your single welded to supporting member 
and you're double welded to supporting member connections. Uh, since what I'm looking at there just had single, we'll start off with that. And you'll see down at the bottom here we have this new table. So if I want to go ahead and use that table, I'm going to go ahead and check that use alternative angle section size. And then what I'm doing in this table is I'm setting it up uh, similar to what you saw in a previous webinar with the non-standard beam gauge joist. Uh, this is actually going to be the workable flat distance that I'm setting up here. So basically between zero and three inches, I could say I want to use a angle three and a half by two and a half by three eighths. And then the next line notice gets automatically filled out with my three. So between three and whatever I may specify there, or in this case, I'm going to leave it at zero, meaning anything three and above would then use this next angle size that I'll put in there, three and a half by three by three eighths. So I'll go ahead and say, okay, just going to go ahead and mark these members for processing and process that. Now the way things were set up, probably not really going to see a change there. But if I edit this, I can see I do have my 3.5 by 3 by 3 eighths being used there. Now what's considered the workable flat on a tube? Well, that's going to be uh, from the center of my beam, and that's going to be out to uh, two times the thickness of the tube. So in this case, if I edit this tube, I can see I have a 3 8 tube. So the workable flat is going to be 3 quarters, which is 3 8 times 2 from the out side of this. If I do 3 quarters, we could see that would be our workable flat distance then. So from center of beam to that, we're at three and a quarter, so it falls within that three and above range. Okay, uh, we have more on that. I'll take a look at that because that works with wide flanges as well. Uh, just want to throw something in there uh, for our Canadian customers that use the CSA design code, uh, you guys typically are not going to do your welds uh, like this on the toe of the angles. I believe your design code specifies that that weld should be along the heel here in the single angle connection. So if I just go ahead and flip that over in my design criteria to use the CSA 10th design method, and I go ahead and mark these for processing, Okay, we should see that weld size, that weld changes. We no longer have that on the toe. We now have that on the heel. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and change that back again. Okay, and going back here to our uh, Alternative angle sizes for our workable flat. I said this does work for wide flanges as well. So if I go ahead and throw in a W10 by 54, we're going to see that works as well. And I'm still falling within that uh, three and above range that I had set up. Uh, let me go ahead and just move this beam over uh, because in the in the uh, wide flange web, basically what it's going to be is it's going to be half the T distance that the workable flat is considered there. So I'm going to move this one over. I'm going to move it over one inch. Confirm that, yes. And once that happens, okay, notice that angle size did change. If I edit that, I can see I now have the three and a half by two and a half by three eighths. So we can see it works in an offset condition there as well. Then you also have that similar table, same options. If I do a double welded to supporting member, I have that same thing here. So I could go ahead and set that up uh, however I needed it here. So if I were to do a similar thing as what I had for my single angles, 
where I do a two and a half and then a three inch leg, I can do that. And then if I go ahead and change this to a double sided angle, right now I'm going to get a shear tab and let's go ahead and just move that back. So we should get our three and a half by three by five sixteenths there then. So kind of see how that works. Uh, showed you at the same time uh, the CSA single angle welds, how it welds out along the heel instead of the toe there. So Next thing we have is enhancements to shear tabs framing to HSS columns. And if I go ahead and uh, open my second floor plan here and take a look at a different section, notice we have our beams framing to a tube column with shear tabs. Uh, what SDS2 is going to be doing now is it checks that tube to see if that, the wall strength of that tube is going to fail. If it is, we can go ahead and add a reinforcing plate in there as we see right here. Uh, by default, that plate is just going to go ahead and extend three-quarter of an inch past the shear tab in, in both the top and bottom direction. Uh, you can edit that connection component, and you have a column reinforce plate section there to where you could change the thickness, the length, the width, everything you should need there you have. Okay, this also works in a moment connection. So if I were to go ahead and change this from an auto standard, set that to a shear, and specify a welded moment. And I'm going to go ahead and just cheat here a little bit, drop my moment load down. Okay, if that's required in a moment, again, we're going to just see that reinforcing plate extend to the past the beam flanges three quarters of an inch to account for all of that. I'm going to go back to just my regular auto standard connection here so we get rid of that moment. Go back there. Now we do have a setup option to tell SDS2 to check for that or not so that's going to be in our job options under plate design criteria. We just have a checkbox for the use HSS column reinforcement plate to use that or not. You do also have the option for that on a case by case basis. If I were to look in my connection specifications, I have the use HSS column reinforcement plate here automatic, which means it's going to look to the setup option to figure out what it should do, or I can specifically say yes or no, don't use that. When I turn that off or set that to no, now in this case, notice I get a failed connection, and it's going to tell me that, in this case, a slender column wall. So turning that off, you won't get that reinforcement plate, but you could end up with a failed connection because of the slender wall in this case, and then it doesn't really have any other options of how to create that connection, so you end up with a failed message. Okay, uh, back to moment connections real quick like. Um, in a bolted moment connection like we see here, we don't actually create fill plates for this connection at this time, uh, but what we've added in here in 2016 is just kind of a conservative check in the design calcs because we kind of have to assume that there will be some sort of fill plates there. Uh, so again, you don't physically see those in the model, but if I were to look at my expanded calc here, and let me pull this up on the right screen, and this is going to actually be on the right end of this beam. And it should be included in design calculation number 68. 
So if I go ahead and find design calculation number 68, we're going to see we have a factor for the fillers added now in that design calculation to, uh, again, just conservatively assume some will be there. And you're going to have a little bit of a reduced shear capacity because of that. Okay, moving on here to the next thing is for tube beams. Uh, typically in the past, we've just provided a shear connection, both sides of that tube. Now what we've added in 2016, if you have the connection type set to shear, if you go into the connection specifications, you do have an option now to use a paddle plate. And we're going to get a paddle plate shear connection uh, like we see there. You should be able to edit that connection component. You have different uh, variables in here for that. Uh, maybe you need to increase the weld length there. You could increase the weld length. And that should go ahead and increase that notch for you as well. Or maybe you needed to increase the rows of bolts or whatever the case is there should have all those different variables in our connection component then. So that does it for the beam connections. Uh, we'll move on to the horizontal brace connections next. And what I want to first start off with is a situation where we have a brace framing to the bottom of beams on one end and on the other end we have that framing to the web of some deeper beams than what's on the other side. Uh, in this case I also put a horizontal brace opposing and if we take a look at this maybe adjust my depth check here a little bit. Okay what we can see happening here is at this end where I'm framing to the web of the beams Notice my gusset plate and that angle is down farther than the opposing one. Well, the reason for that is because my work line of this horizontal brace is actually directly at the bottom of the beams on the left end. I can go ahead and take a look at that. If I turn that to stick, we'll see it's actually right at the bottom there. What SDS2 does in this case, however, is has to go ahead and push the main material down the thickness of the gusset plate that it designs here because it can only at this time connect it to the bottom of the beams here. It doesn't have a connection design code yet to determine how to create a connection if that uh, WT material were right at the bottom because we'd probably have to do something with that plate here and then add additional plates to the top of the bottom flange. Uh, so on and so forth. So there is an improvement that we can see here right off the bat over previous versions. And what that improvement is, is at the right end in previous versions, you always ended up with a gap here. We've corrected that gap, but you do kind of have the issue now with uh, your, your angles having holes in the different gauges and whatnot so depending on what you're looking for here you you may choose to use what I'm going to show you next or you may not so what we actually have added in this edit window is an option up at the top to allow the material work line offset right now it's set to automatic and it's reading a setup option found in fabricator options under member detailing slash fabrication options. If we go to the horizontal braces tab, we have an option there, checkbox to allow the material work line offset. I'm just gonna go ahead and change this in this one case for this one. And I'm gonna set that option to no through the member edit window. Notice my left end now gives me a failed connection. However, on the right end, we can see everything got pushed up. Now our shared connection has uh, the holes aligned and whatnot there. 
If we go back and take a look at the left end, however, we do have a failed connection. And again, that goes back to the reason that I said now that WT material is no longer pushed down the thickness of the gusset. And currently there's no code to tell it how to design the connection in this case. So um, kind of have to weigh your options there a little bit, but it is something that's added. The other thing that we've added for horizontal braces is a clipped option for your gusset plates. So uh, we've had this for vertical braces, just haven't had this for horizontal braces yet to just go ahead and clip the corner of this gusset at 90 degrees to your brace work line. That's going to be found in your fabricator options under standard fabricator connections and gusset plate setup. And we've actually uh, separated this out into different material types as well. So under my horizontal brace options, I can say clip the end on angle, WT, and wide flange brace gussets. Same for vertical brace options up here. That used to be an all or nothing option. We, we separated it out into different materials. So. So if I turn that on, come in here and make that brace go through processing, we should see that corner get clipped then. We also have control of that through the member edit window, so you can change that on a case-by-case -case basis. If I edit that and go ahead and look in my connection specifications, I have a clip end operation, automatic yes, or if I set that to no, it's going to go back to giving me the square gusset plate. Finally, the last thing to cover today is in this same framing situation here where we have a, a horizontal braces framing to beams. That is typically going to transfer some forces into your beams. Uh, so what we've done currently is if we take a look at our design calcs, we should be able to see a note in here that indicates on this that indicates the loads that are actually transferred to those beams. So underneath of our limit states, we get this warning telling us that the connection induces forces into the supporting beams and they might need to be included in the design for those. So you have your beam one, we have 48.6 kips. In parentheses there, that's the member number, so member number 23. And then beam two, member number 26 has 60.75. So if we look, just hover over that, here we have beam number 23, and here we have member number 26. So then we can go ahead and utilize those forces and add those into the beams as uh, required. So uh, that concludes the webinar for this morning and the, the items that I have to cover.